Good morning. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we will proceed. Uh, several members yet to come. Timing, huh? I shall not uh, transgress uh, too much on your time or your patience. Uh, but first, a word about this uh, very good and great man beside me, even though we are the other faith. Uh, he is a person I trust implicitly, a man of his word, uh, a friend, uh, and a patriot. When my old pal Joe Biden called in January and said, Al, I got a real deal for you, I said, uh, I chuckled and I said, forget it. And he called back uh, because I feel when a president of the United States asks a citizen to, to lend their services, you step up in the overused term of the day, especially in athletics. And then when I asked who would be my co chair, they said Erskine Bowles, and I signed on. And uh, I, uh, I, I let me just say it's been a great treat. But let me say this to my 12 legislative colleagues, a cautionary tale. I have been where you are. I feel your pain, in the words of a former president. And and the heat, the, <laughs> the heat is on you. This one is on you. And uh, poised outside of this chamber are the denizens of darkness. I think the workers of the dark arts, in the words of Harry Potter. Those are the groups waiting out there in temples around the city to shred this baby to bits. And they're ready. They've been waiting for a long time to chew this one to pieces. To tell you to do this or don't do this, or, or there may be less cash in your Christmas stocking at your next election, or a black lump of coal, and they're geared up to destroy this work. It's how the city works. It works on negatives and not positives. So that I share with you. And and I know about this because I've been there. I know the feeling. And in the role of leadership uh, that I held, I had to hold my nose uh, and, and voted a, a damn bad one or two, a time or two. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my friend Richard Durbin holds the role I had, assistant majority leader, then slipping, of course, to assistant minority leader, which, of course, he's hoping does not occur, I know. Nevertheless, these groups <coughs> consist often of zealots. <clears throat> a zealot is one who, having forgotten his purpose, redoubles his efforts. There are many of them here. Now, these groups have hauled up their artillery and fire some heavy shells at this old infantryman here and my colleague, and they will pull out all of the stops with massive expenditures of media and advertising, and these ads will be dramatic, powerful, and heart-wrenching, but try to pay them no heed because these purveyors of doom have been lurking here for many years. They're like the man behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, but they get paid big money to lobby and get you all worked up. And so they will, they will have a list, and you can pick one. Just run through a few. Shredding the safety net, disarming America, hurting the poor, helping the poor, punishing seniors, coddling seniors, helping the rich, hurting the rich, stunning growth, cheating veterans, killing jobs, no cutting enough or too much, raising taxes or not raising taxes enough, or cutting taxes or cutting too much, and the list goes on and on and on. These are tough times, requiring tough decisions, and indeed, tough votes. It, it took us many weeks here to establish trust in this commission among ourselves, and I trust you all, each and every one of you, I don't agree with you, for sure, but trust is the 
shimmering coin of the realm in legislating, and it's been very tarnished in recent years in this place. Well, Erskine and I will not and have not pleaded with you to support this plan. We sincerely hope you will, but that is solely your choice. I have been and I have seen on so many of these commissions in the past who come up with decisions and directives and solutions that are absolutely toothless exercises, that are pure mush or watery gruel. Not for us, not this time. Whether we get two votes or 18, this baby ain't going away. Oh, sure, it may be buried in an unmarked grave soon, but when the votes for the budget and to extend the den limit and the debate on that comes up in the spring, this cadaver will rise from the crypt. And you or some of your colleagues will say, in the face of the new faces who will be saying, I'm not voting to increase the debt limit unless I get some spending cuts and a lot more. And the leadership of both parties will say, but we have to do this or the full faith and credit of the U.S. will be in peril or we may even have to close down the government. And some sincere new member honestly will say, that's why I came here. That's what's out there. And the spending cuts will be presented by them, and they, they will be ones that have been selected at random, that have no basis in debate or discussion what we may have discussed here in these past months. And uh, the members will be goaded to support those, not ones that, as I say, have been worked through the process here and thoughtfully debated whether you agreed with them or not, and I think that will be a chaotic time, and even a bloodbath. And I think Americans deserve better, and this plan is a better way. It's an amalgam, a partial consensus in some ways, at least a plan, at least it's a start. And so you may have noted that Jan Schakowsky and I have not always concurred. <laughs> we have. <laughs> she is the canary in the coal mine for my activities, and uh, let me tell you, I admire her. She had the courage to lay out an alternate plan of how to get there. So did Andy. I don't agree with it all, but she laid it out, and so did he. If we can come to the fact, don't reject, reflect. It would be a good thing in this town. Don't reject, reflect. And then we will have a place for it in the appendix of this report. Just relax, just three more handwritten pages. You're looking and <laughs> trying to jab my arm. Now, a final note. <laughs> Things in this world have dramatically shifted, shifted on this planet that we all survive on. Things are very different than they were two to three years ago. We all know the figures and we all know the math. And the fact really is, this is it. No more fun and games, smoke and mirrors, alchemy, trickery, cunning, CYA, demagoguery, and making promises we can't possibly keep. And as Erskine often says, debt, debt denial has gone the way of the dodo bird. And these are not normal times for normal non-solutions. That's what they do here, non-solutions. So I remember so well when I was anguishing over a tough Senate vote, I had to cast, and they wouldn't let me vote maybe. So I would pick out a piece or two of the bill and say, with of course an accompanying CYA press release, of course, that if only section 2B or paragraph 4 had been left out of this marvelous bill, I would have voted for it. But because, and it was because it was a very good bill, but I just couldn't do that to my constituents on paragraph whatever. Now I don't think my constituents or yours will let me or you get away with that anymore. They've wised up, they're mad. They're tired of the bluster and the blather and the ego and the BS that has worked so often for all of us, including me, a master at it. So yes, the times have changed and we will never be the same. The tectonic plates of the old politics have shifted. They know what debt and deficit is and interest. They have done in their own homes as they ponder their plight around their own kitchen table, often with head in their hands, 
and they say, everyone has taken a hit. No, no, wait a minute. All of us took a hit but one, the federal government, and all of its massive minions have been spared in this recession. And we have seen the figures, and we don't know a lot about Greece and Ireland and Spain and Portugal and Italy, but we do know something that if you stay this way, something bad will happen. And these deeply concerned straight thinking and straight talking folks, they know their country is on the same trajectory. And so do we. And they know too that it won't be Bowles or Simpson who will dig them out of this black pit. It will be, it will be your colleagues, your legislative colleagues, only you, no one else, not the president or my pal Joe Biden or anyone else can write this listing ship. Only you 12 and your successors and 523 of your other colleagues and both parties will have to do this Herculean task. Nobody else. Do what you need to do. Do what you must do, guided by your own conscience and principles and a shred of patriotism. And whichever way you go, share it with us in the report on the appendix. Tell us why you don't like it and voted no, and tell us why you don't like it and voted yes. Because that's, that's a wonderful alternative. Those are the only ways out. Those are honest ways. So I admire and respect you all, and you need not explain or comment on your final vote, whichever way, come this Friday. We have listened, visited, negotiated, debated, and discussed all of these issues for us. And I think we've done, all of us have done our level best, and then some. And I want to render deepest thanks for your energy, your time, and your talent, and those same attributes of your fine staffs. And so God bless you, and I then yield to the numbers guy. <laughs> Fog him up, will you? <laughs> I love being the numbers guy. Well, I do too. Is this all? Yeah, no. I think it's on now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, my daddy used to say that true friends are hard to find. They're even harder to make. And if I've gotten nothing else out of this last eight months, I've gotten a real friend in Al Simpson, and that's a rarity, and I'm grateful. Uh, as you all know, we put our chairman's mark out a couple of weeks ago, seems like years ago now. Made, got a little more attention than I thought it might. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it probably deserved it. Uh, you know, we, in that chairman's mark, uh, we take $4 billion out of a deficit over the next nine years. We cut the deficit in half by 2015 and by three quarters uh, in 2020. We take the jet deficit to GDP down to about 2.2% of GDP uh, in 2015. Uh, the president asked us to get to 3% and we get it down to 1.2% uh, in 2020. And I think we can all be proud of that. I can tell you, Al said that as he travels through airports, he gets more thumbs up than he does other digits. Uh, I can tell you from my viewpoint, I usually go to the liquor store when I leave here. Uh, but I'm going to, when I go to the grocery store, here's what people in North Carolina tell me. 100%, I don't care who they are, they say stay strong. Don't wimp out on this, Erskine. Stay at it, get that deficit down. And I think that's what we will do, regardless of the vote. Uh, you all have been great. I have never been involved in a more nonpartisan, this is not bipartisan, this has been nonpartisan. Uh, I've spent more time in Tom Coburn's conference room uh, uh, than I have uh, my own house, I think, in the last eight months. And, and he has become my friend and my doctor <laughs> in this time period. Uh, uh, all of you have been uh, as polite about this document as you can. There are some things you like. There are some things you dislike. I think Senator Durbin said it best. He said there were some things in, in this original draft that the devil would hate more than holy water. And, you know, that's probably as, as much as somebody can dislike something. But everybody has said, and 
including the folks at the White House. This is a serious proposal. Uh, it was a good starting point, and I want to thank you all for treating it as such. No matter what happens, I think this little commission of 18 people that have been meeting for the last eight to nine months uh, has succeeded. Uh, we have fundamentally changed the debate in America. All you got to do is look around this room and you can see that. Uh, we put the debt issue on the map, and I think we owe an enormous uh, debt of gratitude to Senators Gregg and Conrad. We would not be here without those two. They have been phenomenal. They wanted this to be a legislative process. We couldn't get a legislative process. They got this commission, and this commission has brought this enormous issue to the attention of America. So I thank the two of you. You are the captains. Now, now I don't know if we can agree on a plan. Uh, I'm an optimist. I always have been. Uh, Maybe we'll get two votes. Uh, I know we're going to get two votes. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Maybe we'll get five. Maybe we'll get 14. Uh, nothing would surprise me uh, uh, in this. But I know the world is moving in our direction, for better or for worse, because of what you see going on around the world just today, if you read today's newspapers. But I do know there's no turning back now. Uh, the era of debt denial and the denial of its consequences are over. Uh, each of you, uh, I think, can take enormous pride in that. Together, I think we have started an adult conversation uh, that will dominate the debate until the elected leadership here in Washington does something real. And I can tell you, as a state employee, the states have been doing something real. We've had to balance our budgets and that has mean, meant very, very painful cuts for us at the university. Uh, municipalities all over the country have, businesses are, and every family does it sitting around their kitchen table. So I think Washington is going to get on board. I think it's impossible to sweep uh, our country's vast debt problem under the carpet anymore, and I'm glad of that. Now, you know, we've gotten some nice editorials. Uh, about this from organizations as diverse as the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, the New Republic and the National Review, and as wide reaching as my hometown Charlotte Observer, uh, to the Kansas City Star, to the Louisville Journal, to the Tacoma Daily Tribune, and I could go on and on. But, but my point is, Al and I didn't get in this to get nice editorials. We got in it to do something real, uh, and to do something that would really make a difference for this country and would make us competitive again. I think the American people want us to do something real. I think they want us to make the tough decisions. And none of these decisions are easy. The problem is real. The solutions are all painful. Uh, and there's no easy way out. Uh, I think for many years, elected officials have been worried they would be punished if they made the tough decisions. I think for all of us, we're going to be penalized if we play politics, which none of you have, not one of you, uh, if we duck the tough calls or if we take a walk on this enormous problem we face. Al and I are not going to wimp out. Uh, I think you can see from our 2.0 uh, presentation you have today. For us, it's go big or go home. Uh, we're going home anyway, right, partner? Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, we want a serious proposal uh, we can be proud of. We're not interested in 14 votes uh, for a whitewash. Uh, but this problem is just too plain big and too important for our country. Uh, the plan that you now have in front of you is one that Al and I are proud of. Uh, we believe it will keep our nation from falling into the abyss created by promises that are greater than our nation can keep and created by way, way, way too much leverage. I have lived in a world where there is such a thing as reverse leverage. I have lived in a world of compound interest rates, and I can tell you, you can't beat it. It is really tough, and it will bring you down. It will bring you down fast. Uh, I want to go through the plan. Uh, since we haven't done that publicly, I'll do it in about 10 minutes, so I apologize for having you all sit through that. Then we want to hear what each of you think. Uh, none of you got the plan uh, 
uh, till late yesterday or early this morning. Uh, I didn't get it any sooner than you have. Uh, I, well, I have helped write the final plan. I haven't read through the final plan myself even yet. Uh, so we're not going to ask you to vote today on something you haven't thoroughly reviewed. I think a couple of members stayed up and have thoroughly reviewed it, and I'm glad they have, and they may want to express their opinion. Uh, but we want to have your response uh, by Friday and hear where each of you stand on the plan. Rest assured, I don't expect any of you to like every aspect of this plan. I don't like every aspect of this plan, and each of you know it, whether you're Democrats or Republicans. To vote for this plan, each of us will have to tolerate provisions we opposed or previously opposed in order to reach a principled compromise. We will have to put our differences aside to forge a plan because our nation will certainly be lost if we don't have one. We do not pretend, pretend in this exercise to have all the answers. We have tried to offer an aggressive, fair, balanced, and bipartisan proposal that is assuredly as serious as the problems we face in this nation today. The plan is built around some basic principles, and I'll take maybe 10 minutes to describe the plan, and then we'll hear from each of you. Uh, this has not been a bean counting exercise for us. This is about America being competitive in this global economy. It's about pulling together, not pulling apart. And the principles are pretty simple. We don't want to do anything that disrupts a really fragile economic recovery. We want to protect the truly disadvantaged. We want to keep America safe and secure while acknowledging that may require us to change our missions. We don't want to hollow out this country while we fix our balance sheet. Therefore, if we're going to be competitive in what is a knowledge-based global economy, we're going to have to make sure we continue to make smart investments in education, infrastructure, and high-value-added research. We've got to reform the tax code. There are $1.1 trillion worth of tax earmarks in this tax code. We argue about $16 billion worth of earmarks in the spending bills. These tax earmarks are just spending by another name, and basically they benefit people like me. If we eliminate these tax earmarks, $1.1 trillion a year, we can bring the rates way, way down to areas like 8%, 14% and 23%. We can reduce the corporate rate and make America one of the best places to start and grow a business. And we can broaden the base, simplify the code, and we can do a lot to get America moving forward again. We think there should be a ceiling on revenues of 21%. We think we ought to cut spending wherever it is, whether it's in the defense budget, non-defense, or if you want to call it security and non-security, entitlements, or in the tax code. And believe me, there is spending in the tax code. And lastly, separate from deficit reduction, we want to keep Social Security solvent for the next 75 years, and today it is not. Our plan reduces the deficit by $4 trillion over the next nine years, approximately. It cuts the deficit in half in 2015 and by three quarters in 2020, taking the deficit to GDP ratio down to 2.3% in, in 2015, which is more than the President asked us to do, uh, and it takes it down to 1.2% in 2020. Our discretionary budget over the next nine years takes $1.7 trillion out of a discretionary budget. In the year 2015, which we've been asked to focus on, it reduces the discretionary budget by $172 billion. We put forward over $200 billion in specific cuts, pay-fors, for this $172 billion worth of spending cuts. So if anybody wants to know where the specifics are, we got them. Uh, we divide the budget between security and non-security, and we put a firewall between them. 
there's only one reason we do that. We want to make sure the spending cuts are on both sides of the ledger. We budget for the first time $11 billion a year for disaster spending because we're going to have disasters in this country. And that is, where did we come up with the $11 billion? We came up from it because that's the average of the last 10 years taking out the high and low. Uh, we tighten the provisions, uh, the definition of what can be called a disaster so everything doesn't get glumped in there. We tighten the provisions for what can be called an emergency. We do the same thing for the OCO, which is the wars that we're fighting. We tighten the provisions significantly for what can go into that budget. And we require a 60 vote point of order in order to make sure that, uh, that all of these recommendations we make will be very difficult uh, not to occur. Uh, on the tax side, we, did, uh, we are recommending the zero plan, uh, which I think we've gotten a uh, good response from both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, uh, we're not the Ways and Means Committee. We're not finance. Our plan says to develop a plan uh, that meets uh, several principles. Those principles are to broaden the base, lower the rates, simplify the code, and reduce the deficit. We eliminate all tax expenditures. We take the rates to 8, 14, and 23, with the break points being $70,000 and $210,000, and in no case do we want to see the rate go above 29%. Uh, we reduced the deficit by $80, $80 billion in 2015 and by $180 billion in 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, Congress can choose to add back uh, key provisions uh, as it relates to the earned income tax credit, uh, the child tax credit, the home mortgage deduction, retirement, health, charitable deductions, recognizing that each add back raises rates. They're not for free. Uh, we asked the Tax Policy Center to develop a distributional analysis of an illustrated ta illustrative tax plan uh, that adds back a 12% credit on home mortgages up to $500,000, a 12% credit on charitable contributions above 2% of adjusted gross income uh, that caps the employee health care exclusion in 2014 and phases it out uh, by 2038 and a few others. The rates uh, under that scenario, as an example, go from 8, 14, and 23 to 12, 22, and 28, and it maintains or improves progressivity. I'm not asking you to approve the addbacks. I'm just uh, adding you, asking you to recognize that they do have a cost. Uh, health care. Uh, we take uh, two positions on health care. We look at it in the short term and the long term. In the short term, we want to make sure that we raise the funds to pay for what you all call the doc fix, which now amounts to $267 billion and is financed through the deficit and to repeal the Class Act, which will cost us about $76 billion to do because you have pay people paying in over the first five years and then benefits dwarfing what is paid in and a very big unfunded mandate in the out years. Uh, we pay for those with $400 billion or more than $400 billion worth of cuts. Uh, in Medicare, uh, we make some cuts as it relates to fraud. We do have more cost sharing. We do restrict first dollar coverage, so everybody's got some skin in the game. Uh, we extend the Medicaid drug payment to dual eligibles, and we reduce the excess payment to hospitals for medical education. Uh, those add up to about $298 billion. We also cut the payments for bad debt and accelerate the home health savings provision. In Medicaid, we eliminate state gaming uh, of Medicaid tax gimmicks, which we see done in my state and about every other state. Uh, we also uh, take the dual eligibles, go to Medicaid managed care, and we reduce the administrative costs. Those save us about $78 billion. Other savings uh, that we have come from malpractice reform. Uh, we pilot a premium support plan in the FEHB, and the doctors actually pay a little bit more. Uh, and those save about uh, $47 billion. 
I'm almost through. Uh, other long-term health care changes that we propose, uh, the new Affordable Care Plan says that it will control the, the growth of health care at the rate of GDP plus one. We hope that's true. If it doesn't, uh, we put in a global cap at GDP plus one percent to include all federal health care spending, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIPS, the exclusions, the FEHB, TRICARE for Life, the exchange subsidiaries, all federal health care spending. Uh, and we say, look, if what you have out there doesn't work, America must take more drastic steps because we have to control the rate of increase in the cost of health care and get it down to GDP plus one. Therefore, we would recommend that if that happens, that the Congress look at the premium support plan like the Ryan Rivlin plan for Medicare, uh, that we consider block granting Medicaid. Uh, we have a robust public option uh, where we have more cost sharing uh, and sharing a benefit design, uh, strengthening iPad, or we give CMS the authority to be more active purchasers of health care using uh, coverage and reimbursement policy to encourage higher value services. In other words, boy, you're going to have to do something really tough if what we say works doesn't work. Other mandatory changes we have put forth in our plan uh, that reduce the deficit uh, relate to the federal workforce retirement plans, where we do such things as use the high five rather than the high three. We reduce ag subsi uh, subsidies. We eliminate in-school subsidies in the federal student loan program. Uh, we give the Pension Benefit Guarantee Board authority to increase premiums so we can get that darn thing out of deficit. We eliminate payments uh, for abandoned mines. That made Al particularly happy. Uh, we extend the FCC Spectrum Authority. We index mandatory user fees to inflation. We reinstate, oh, excuse me, we restructure the Power Marketing Administration to charge market rates. We require TVA to improve transmission surcharges and we give the post office greater management authority so that we don't have these deficits of about $8.5 billion off budget, uh, and that would include considering doing such things as eliminating Saturday delivery and closing post office uh, in this time of electronic mail. Uh, on Social Security, and then I will be done, and we'll open it up to you all. Uh, we do two things that make our job more difficult. Uh, in meeting the requirement to reduce the, uh, to bring the thing, bring Social Security into 75 year solvency. We raise the minimum payment that someone can get to 125% of poverty. Uh, and we want to take care, again, our principle of taking care of a truly disadvantaged. And we were also told by every expert that you have to take care of the older, old people between 82 and 86. And so between 82 and 86, everybody gets a 1% bump up per year. Obviously, that makes our job more difficult because that adds cost. To meet that cost, we put in progressivity uh, payments that hit the upper 50%. Uh, and the current break points are at 90% of wages, 32% and 15. We change those break points to 90, 30%, 10, and 5. And again, protect the bottom 50%. We do have longevity in our report. As you all know, currently uh, the Social Security age goes to uh, 67 in 2027. Uh, we take it to 68, 40 years from now, and to 69, 65 years from now. I hope that gives people time to get prepared for it. Uh, we do put in a hardship exemption because we also take up the early retirement age to 63 and 64. 40 and 65 years from now. Uh, and because we do that, some people are in really tough, backbreaking, physically demanding jobs and have to retire at 62. And we acknowledge that, and so we pay for this. We have a hardship exemption that takes care of the 20% of people who have those kind of jobs in the U.S. We go to the change CPI from the regular CPI because it more accurately reflects inflation. Uh, we bring in new state and local workers and instead of taxing somewhere between 83 and 86 percent of wages uh, and capping it there, uh, we go back to the original 90 percent of wages. What does that mean? Today the cap is $106,800. Uh, in 2020, 
it goes to $168,000, and our plan takes it to $190,000 from $168,000 in 2020. That is our plan. Uh, I thank you for indulging uh, my going through it, and I'll now open it for comments, and we'll start with Senator Conrad. Well, first of all, I want to thank our co-chairs. Uh, you've done your duty. You've been brave. You've shown courage. And most of all, you've put before us a plan that I think is critically important for the nation. I also want to thank uh, my partner, Senator Judd Gregg, who is a uh, ranking Republican on the Budget Committee. And he and I, several years ago, came up with the notion that we absolutely needed a commission to come forward with a plan. And uh, Senator Gregg is going to be very much missed in the United States Senate. It's certainly going to be missed by me. And I thank him for his leadership. I thank uh, every member of this commission, whether you decide to support this effort or oppose it. Um, I think every member has demonstrated a real commitment to the work of this commission and has brought a perspective that was important. And I deeply appreciate that as well, and certainly to the staff who has worked so extraordinarily hard, led by Bruce Reed. But I want to thank every member of the staff, because I know you have worked weekends, you have worked nights, you have worked long hours, and I think you've demonstrated real commitment to the country that should be recognized and applauded. Uh, Uh, to me, this is a defining moment, and I have had a chance to read the plan. In fact, I've now read it three times, uh, late last night and twice more this morning. Uh, I really believe we are at a critical juncture. We are borrowing 40 cents of every dollar that we spend in this country. Our revenue as a share of our national income is the lowest it's been in 60 years. Our spending is the highest it's been in 60 years as a share of our national income. That is not sustainable. We are headed for a fiscal cliff. America is in danger. And we can either look the other way, hope somebody else does something, or we can act. This commission has been given a very serious responsibility. And our obligation was to work, to come together, to produce a plan that would bring America back from the brink. And while there are things in this plan I dislike intensely, and I do, there are also things in this plan that I think are grand slam uh, home runs for the American economy and for the future competitive position of our country. So. We're now at a time when we have to decide. I understand not necessarily at this moment or today because other members have not yet had a chance to fully review the plan. I must say I believe I have, and I'm prepared to make a decision, and I am prepared to support this plan and to support it strongly because I don't see another alternative. I just don't. This is the work of Democrats and Republicans, people appointed by the leadership of the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat, people appointed by the President of the United States, 18 Americans who have been given a heavy responsibility. And I think they've responded in a serious way. As I look at this plan just briefly, I think one of the most important things it does is restore the solvency of Social Security, the 75-year solvency of Social Security. And it does not take the savings and apply them to the deficit. The deficit reduction, some $4 trillion over the next 10 years, is done separately. This plan also, I believe, one of the most important things calls for fundamental, thoroughgoing tax reform. Lower the rates, wipe out some of the tax expenditures that have been, uh, really have run out of control. Uh, to help make America more competitive, to make the tax system more fair, 
i think those are critically important components and it will also generate more revenue in fact i believe it will generate more revenue than any forecast because when you reduce the option and the opportunity to game the tax system and i used to be a tax commissioner uh... you're going to generate more revenue i believe that so I said earlier there are things I don't like. I'll withhold talking about those <laughs> because every one of us could go through page after page and find things we really don't like. Let me just conclude by saying I, I think this is a critically important moment. And whether or not we get 14 votes, and I very much hope we do, I think this is going to provide a guidepost for decisions that must be made and the sooner they're made, the better for this country. I've followed events, as I know all the commissioners have, over the last weeks in Europe. If that doesn't sober us all, seeing first Greece, then Ireland, now Portugal, possibly Spain, if we fail to act now, our country could find itself in a circumstance in which we have to take draconian action at the worst possible time in the midst of a crisis. I pray to God that we have the wisdom to act before that point. And I thank the chairs and I thank the commissioners. Thank you, sir. Thank Senator you. Gregg. Thank you very much, Frank. Well, let me join with everyone else on this commission in thanking you, the chairman, and your extraordinary staff for what you've done. Uh, First, in the way you've managed these meetings, uh, it has been intense and constant, uh, and it's been thorough, informative, and substantive. And I congratulate you for your leadership. It's been a tremendous uh, benefit for this nation. Uh, I also want to thank the folks who've been on the commission. I mean, this, this is a pretty talented group of people. I mean, I don't want to say that about myself, but <laughs> accepting myself, and maybe Kent, it's a pretty talented <laughs> The time and commitment has been extraordinary, and uh, the thought process and, and the ideas brought to the table have been exceptional. As I look at this, this is about America's greatness. We are the most exceptional nation in the world. And the world's looking at us, and they're saying, how could such an exceptional nation have gotten in such trouble? How could we be on a path which is essentially going to drive us into some form of bankruptcy. It'll be an unusual form of bankruptcy, but it'll be a form of bankruptcy because our debt will be unsustainable and our capacity to pay the interest on that debt will threaten the value of our currency and the lifestyle of every American. This is about Main Street. But it's about where we go as a country. Uh, and we, as the people who are charged with the governance, have a responsibility to not let that happen. And you can't deny the facts. We are on a course which, because of the demographic shift in this culture, where we go from 35 million retired people to 70 million retired people over the next five to seven years, and for other reasons, which are, have generated a few, little bit of a debate around this table, our government is growing at a rate that is simply unaffordable and unsustainable. And the inevitable fact is that if it continues on this of course, prosperity for Americans will be jeopardized, and we will be the first generation in the history of this country to pass a less prosperous and secure nation onto our children. And that is antithetical to the American culture. The American culture demands that the next generation have more opportunity and be more secure than the prior generation. That's just the essence of what America is about. And so this really is about America's greatness. Now, this product is not perfect, nor is it global. It doesn't even solve the problem. It just allows us to put in place a glide path, or not a glide path, but a pathway that says to, the American, to, says to Americans and the world, we are serious about doing something about the problem. The problem will still be there, even if everything in this proposal were adopted because we'd still have a debt to GDP ratio between 60 and 70 percent by 2020. 
which is way above our historical position, which, was, which should be no more than 40% if we're, if we're going to be really solvent. Uh, but it is a package which does make a definitive step in the right direction because it does significantly reduce the deficit and the debt, and it does bend the increase in debt in the out years, and it does bring down the deficit, and it addresses glaring problems with our, with our fiscal policy. Now, on the spending side of the ledger, on the discretionary side, I think Republicans are going to be pretty comfortable with this, I would hope. I mean, we go, it goes down to 2008 baseline by 2013. That's a rather dramatic action. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of folks who are going to be upset about programmatic cuts and changes. The tax policy becomes, I think, the big issue for those of us on our side of the aisle, because there is a lot of tax policy in this bill that generates revenue. And how the revenue use, is used is, a, is the issue. I, I have always found it unconscionable that we debate constantly about raising rates. Why do we debate about raising rates? That's not the issue in tax policy. What we should be debating about is reducing rates and how you reduce rates in a way that generates economic growth. And so this proposal in this bill, the essence of it, the core of it, almost all the revenues in this bill, with the exception of the, of the Social Security, which is held in a separate account, is driven by a tax policy which takes us out of this box of debating whether or not we're going to raise rates and into what I think is the proper playing field, which is how you get rates down dramatically and allow money to be invested for the purposes of creating prosperity and economic activity rather than to be invested for the purposes of avoiding taxes. And the zero plan is the ultimate on steroids Reagan-Bradley tax reform. I was on the Ways and Means Committee in 86 when we did Reagan-Bradley and it took a lot of heavy lifting to eliminate that stuff <coughs> and get those rates down to 28, top rate down to 28 percent. Uh, this takes that approach and puts it in overdrive. I happen to think if we did the zero plan, the explosion in economic activity in this country would be extraordinary. And the tax numbers in this bill would be almost irrelevant. And that's why Senator Crapo has insisted, because I think he sees that also, that to the extent that happens, the rates could continue to go down. Um, but the fact is, this is the, where the debate should be, in my opinion. It shouldn't be on whether we take the rates from 35% to 39% or 39% to 42%. It should be on whether we take the rates from 35% to 21% and get in the process a better tax law that delivers a more effective use of dollars for capital formation in this country. So I think as Republicans, even though there's going to be heartburn about where these proceeds go, because they are going to be a lot of proceeds, it is the right debate. Social Security, as, as Senator Conrad says, and it has been an honor and privilege to work with Senator Conrad as chairman of the Budget Committee. It was even a bigger honor to work with him when he was the ranking member on the Budget <laughs> Committee. <laughs> as we came for, as he has driven, really, the, the, ex, the effort here to try to r recognize the regular order can't handle this issue and that we have to step outside it, which is why this commission was created. But Social Security has been set off here and made solvent for 75 years, and you can tinker with the ways it was done, but there are only four or five moving parts in Social Security, and everybody knows we've got we to address it. But the issue of spending, restraint, and tax policy in this bill, I think, is, is moving dramatically in the right direction. The only issue remains health care. There is health care initiative in here, but we're, you know, we have, we've been through the health care debate. We're going to have to revisit it at some point. This commission, I think, made the right decision of not going to the core of the health care debate, but doing some substantive things which will significantly impact health care. In the end, whether this commission gets 14, 10, or 16 votes, I think this document becomes the memo that controls the meeting, to use Henry Kissinger's words. And in the end, today, We've reached a point where it's time to govern. It's that simple. We either as a nation govern or we risk losing our greatness. And this is a template for beginning that governance. And I congratulate you for it, and I intend to support it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll go to the order of Senator Durbin. Um,
Mr. Cody, uh, Ms. Rivlin, and uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky, and then we'll go to Mr. Hensling and Mr. Ryan and Mr. Bracero. I apologize for maybe stepping out of line. I have to run to a Senate Judiciary Committee to make a quorum, and they just gave me a note on it. So <clears throat> thank you for giving me a chance to say a word. First, thanks to you, Erskine and Alan, as well as Bruce, for the extraordinary job that you did. I made this point at an earlier meeting. I can't think of a major effort on Capitol Hill that has been so thinly but so well staffed. Uh, and I congratulate you for gathering together uh, some of the most extraordinary minds in our country to produce uh, this product, which is honest and addresses the challenge you were given as chairs of this commission. Uh, we talked a little bit this morning that uh, your entire effort could have gone unnoticed and this report could have gathered dust somewhere and never been referred to. But the opposite occurred because of your hard work and because of uh, the fact that you put us to work. I want to thank my colleagues. Jed Gregg, I'm going to miss you. I've got to say it publicly. Uh, even though we've debated a lot of issues, you're a great leader in the Senate. And I'm glad that uh, you inspired us to sit together at this table, even though many of us questioning why we volunteered for this root canal. Uh, we, <laughs> we need to be here. And Kent Conrad, uh, I want to say the same. The two of you together, I, I know I was kind of sitting by the sidelines in a plane as you were hatching this idea uh, during a trip that we took together. And I thank you both for uh, bringing us uh, to this moment. To the public members here, thank you for being part of this. We all go to work at this zip code every day, but you've come in here and um, really added to this conversation and this dialogue. Um, and I, I want to just say a few general things. I saw this first time this morning, and clearly I'm not going to make a commitment at this moment, but want to study it very carefully because there's so many moving parts and important decisions. We often draw the analogy of our responsibility to an American family facing an economic crisis. What would they do? Well, we've talked about sitting down at the kitchen table, and I think people still do that, I hope they do, and making hard choices. But clearly, when they're making hard budget choices for their family, they usually don't include cutting off the insulin for grandma. They usually don't include cutting off medicine for a child. There are certain things which a family will go to the absolute furthest lengths possible to protect. And many of us feel that's what we need to do here. We believe that any crisis America faces will require shared sacrifice. But the most vulnerable in our country uh, cannot sacrifice the same as those of us who are physically and economically uh, fitter and in better shape to do so. And that is the standard I use as a progressive. I believe that we have to look at the bottom line and see where the most vulnerable in America, the elderly, the poor, our children, how they fare under this. And we have to do everything in our power to protect them at the expense of the rest of us. And that's why some of the debates over taxes um, leave me uh, struggling to understand. I understand, uh, Judd Gregg, when you talk about lower tax rates and the economic engine they could create, but we've had times of great economic expansion in this country when our tax rates were substantially higher than they are today. So I'm not sure that I buy the premise. I know you believe it, and most Republicans do, but when it comes to shared sacrifice, I believe those who have been blessed in our society should pay more and expect to sacrifice more than those who have not. As I look through this plan, there are several things that concern me. Uh, first, let me say the good things. Thank you for what you did on these tax expenditures. I've been in Congress and around Congress for 29 years. We've never had this conversation. We have never put everything on the table and said, now, what's important? We just incrementally, year after year, make modifications in a uh, tax code that most people never read or understand and think that it really doesn't have any impact. It does. It's $1.1 trillion a year coming out of the Treasury because of deductions and credits. And it is, it is fair for us to step back and say, if you eliminated all of them and reduced rates, would America be better off? Would families be better off? I think that's a fair question, and I'm glad you raised it. And I think you did it in an honest way. Give us choices, and we have to make the choices. Uh, and we need to save money in the process. I think that's fair. Secondly, I was around when uh, we reformed Social Security in 1983 or 84, whichever year it was, and bought 
dramatically uh, years ahead, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of solvency for Social Security with some painful choices. I'm going to say something now that is heretical on the left, and they won't like me for saying it, but what you have suggested in increasing the Social Security retirement age is acceptable to me. To raise it one year over 40 years is hardly radical. To raise it two years over 65 years is not radical. And providing as you have for two things, those in manual labor who need to retire at an earlier age because they're worn out and can't continue working, and to provide extra help for those older people on Social Security who need a helping hand more than others. These things are sensible, and we've got to accept sensible alternatives to move forward on the left and on the right. Let me say there are two or three things in here that I think you've missed the mark on, and I'll just lay them out on the table. Your There's, time has expired. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I expected that. <laughs> okay. First, let me say this. Um, I, I happen to believe, as a, an appropriation subcommittee chair, that what is written in here is not correct. You argue that eliminating earmarks saves $16 billion. That reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of how the appropriations process works. As a subcommittee chair, I am given a mark, a 302B mark, X dollars. They say you can appropriate up to that mark and not beyond it. Within that mark, I take literally one half of 1% and have congressionally directed spending, but it's within the mark. So if you're putting a cap on the overall spending, the mark any appropriation subcommittee will receive is already established. And if within that mark there are earmarks or not earmarks, they're still going to appropriate to the mark. So there's no $16 billion of savings by eliminating earmarks. That to me is part of the mythology which is going on in the country. And I've been through those chapters of mythology that involved term limits and um, no tax pledges and balanced budget amendments and all the rest, and this is the issue du jour, and I'm sorry that you included it because I don't think that it really reflects honestly what earmarks are all about. Secondly, medical malpractice, and I'll say a word about it because it's something I did for a living before I came to this place. I'm glad that you eliminated caps. I was prepared to make an impassioned plea to eliminate them, but the changes that you made here, for example, on joint and several liability are esoteric to most of the people following this, but your changes have been analyzed to increase the cost of medical care. I know you didn't want to, you wanted to do just the opposite, but they increased the cost of medical care, and there are studies to establish that. The third point I want to make is the FEHBP change, the Federal Employees Health Benefit Program change, which allows uh, Congressman Ryan, I believe is the one who came up with the proposal, of a voucher system, or at least capping the amount that the government pays on for health insurance for federal employees. I don't know, I, we discussed this morning why they have been selected. I don't think it is a fair selection. I will just say this. As I look at the proposals on health care here, we are hastening the day when the only option left will be a public option. Because we are saying we are going to limit the deductions for health insurance premiums, and we are going to limit the amount of money the federal government pays for federal employees, and the question is whether the private sector will then reduce cost. I don't believe they will, and we will find ourselves at a point where we have no alternative. I happen to embrace a public option as an option. Others don't, but I think this calls for a change in the private sector, which they have not demonstrated at any point they are willing to make. I'm going to study this carefully and closely. I know the decision time will be very shortly, but I thank you for your honest and good effort. Thank you, Dick. Thanks very much. Mr. We'll go now to Mr. Cody, then Director Rivlin and then Ms. Tchaikovsky, uh, then Ryan, Henselling, Becerra, and, and Spratt. Spratt, and Fudge. Okay, in our first meeting about seven months ago, I mentioned that in my travels around the world, and I travel a fair amount, as you know, my observation has been that successful countries were able to act with collective purpose and with the political will to get things done. We have a serious national debt problem, and it has global implications. We're being watched by countries with similar problems looking for a model. And more importantly, we're being watched by countries who consider us past our prime, because we can no longer rally as Americans to accomplish the tough things. That we've come to a point where we'd rather revel in our discordant pluralism 
than act with collective purpose as Americans. As a country, we need to stop the demagoguing where everyone just runs to their neutral corner and yells and screams at the other guys. American public is smarter than that, yet I don't believe anybody's really giving them the facts. And we need to be capable as a government of having a more nuanced, thoughtful conversation amongst ourselves and with the public. The facts are that we had a net national debt before the recession of $6 trillion, and today it's $9 trillion. 45% of our debt is held outside the United States, with about $1 trillion of that money loaned to us by China. Over the next 10 years, even with optimistic economic and cost assumptions, that debt grows to $20 trillion in 2020. Ten years from now, our interest bill alone will be a trillion dollars a year. Now, we believe that generally that millions are a lot, and some of us deal with billions in our work lives, but a trillion, a trillion is difficult to grasp. So to put it into perspective, if you had spent a million dollars a day since Jesus Christ was born 2,010 years ago, you would still not have spent a trillion dollars. And that will be our annual interest bill. The American public is on to the right issue, but for some of the wrong reasons. Many want to point to the, quote, Bush tax cuts or the stimulus or earmarks as the issue. Now, while important, these are all sideshows as we accumulate $20 trillion in debt over the next 10 years. The big issue is that my generation, the baby boomer generation, is retiring. And as we move through Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we will crush the system. The Commission has proposed about $2.5 trillion in spending cuts and a trillion in tax increases cumulatively over the next 10 years. On spending, that's about a 5% reduction over what was planned to be spent. It still increases about 4% a year for 10 years. Similarly, on taxes, the $1 trillion is about 3% more than what was planned. That is hardly revolutionary. Yet I've never seen such hyperbole as that which accompanies every piece of taxes or spending. And for the 12 politicians on this commission, I honestly don't know how you get your jobs done with the kind of yelling and screaming that goes on about these things. But this is a job that needs to get done. These difficult political decisions will get made one of two ways. The first is we can do it thoughtfully and proactively. The second is we can wait for the bond market to force it upon us. And that will be decidedly harder, more abrupt, and unpleasant. We can ask Greece and Ireland what that's like, and soon Italy, Spain, and Portugal. Now, many people have a hard time relating to what the bond market is or why they should be concerned. So think about it this way. About $4 trillion of our debt today, about 45%, is money loaned to us by foreign countries, with a trillion dollars of it loaned to us by China. What happens when they don't want to loan us any more money? Where do we go? What do we do? What happens when the bank, in this case, foreign countries like China, doesn't want to loan you any more money? We've benefited a lot in this time from being viewed as the world's reserve currency, the safe haven, if you will. What happens when we're not viewed that way anymore? When we have to raise the price we pay, in other words, interest, to attract the loans we need from foreign countries. When the interest rates Americans have to pay for home, schooling, and car loans go up for the same reasons, thereby hurting the very people that we think we're protecting. Finance is not an exciting subject, but this goes to the core of our own economic and homeland security. And when that decline does come, it doesn't come in small monthly doses, giving us 20 months to adjust. It happens overnight when the herd runs against you and fear grips the market. The American public deserves better. I don't like everything that's in this proposal, and in reality, I don't think it's big enough and it goes nowhere near far enough to sort out our most pressing spending issue, Medicare and Medicaid. But I do know we need to start somewhere. There's plenty of blame to go around on how we got here. There's also plenty of opportunity to work together 
and demonstrate the political will some countries in the world believe we no longer have. There does come a time when we have to act with collective purpose to do what's right for the country. We have to come together, Democrats and Republicans, old and young, business and labor, stop arguing and start agreeing. This is one of those issues. We can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. This is a time for us to pull together, not pull apart. While I'm not enamored of everything in the co-chair's proposal, and I do wish it went further, I do believe this is a time for us to pull together as a country. Erskine and Allen, I do think you guys have done one hell of a job working with Bruce and his team and all of us as commission members to develop a realistic and doable plan. I also know we don't officially vote until Friday, but I wanted to let you know today that I'm with you. I'm your third vote. So thanks for everything you've done. I'm counting five now. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that, uh, Director Revlin. I, too, want to commend our co-chairs and this fabulous staff for having done all this work and put together a really serious plan. And serious is a word that uh, we've heard a lot this morning, but uh, that's what it is. And I think it's a serious plan to address what I regard as a clear and urgent threat to the prosperity of the U.S. economy uh, going uh, forward. Uh, if we have a debt crisis, and we could have fairly quickly, and as Dave Cody has said, when these things happen, they happen fast, and you can't stop it. Uh, we don't want to put ourselves in a position where this could happen. Uh, we need to uh, take action. And I share with my fellow Democrats and, and, and Republicans that the feeling that we have to protect uh, low-income people and, and uh, low-wage earners and uh, the vulnerable. But we also have to think what happens to them if we have another economic catastrophe. Uh, the best thing we can do for the most vulnerable people in America is to have a prosperous, high-growth economy uh, and not another crisis. Those, I, I believe, are the choices uh, that we face. Now, everybody has said there's a lot of pain here. Uh, there is, but there is a lot of opportunity. I, I really think uh, the question is not can we bear the pain, but can we seize the opportunity? Uh, the opportunity to reform the tax system in a way that would give us a, a fairer, more pro-growth uh, and more progressive uh, tax system. The opportunity to uh, take some steps, and not complete ones, toward uh, a more efficient uh, health care system. Uh, and the opportunity to direct spending, uh, both domestic and defense, into higher uh, priorities. Uh, can we seize those opportunities? And I think this plan moves us in that direction. We could have a higher growth, more efficient uh, economy, and a more efficient, fairer public sector if we do many of these things. That said, uh, like everybody, this wasn't my favorite set of, uh, of options. If I'd been, I'd have tweaked it here, tweaked it there. So I am going to vote for it, but I'm also going to give you a little list of things I would have liked to have seen in it. I would have liked to have seen uh, uh, some upfront stimulus, because I think we really need uh, to uh, get out of, be sure we're getting out of this recession. I would have shifted the balance uh, away from uh, uh, so many spending cuts and toward a little more uh, revenue. Uh, I'm a little nervous about the timing of this large discretionary uh, spending cut in, uh, in 2013. But that said, uh, this is a very serious plan for dealing with an imminent catastrophe, and I hope it starts the Congress on a path uh, toward a solution before it's too late. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am, and thank you for your plan, too. It was very helpful to us. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky. I want to tell you what an honor it's been for me to be on this commission and to thank the co-chairs. 
Um, and while we have disagreed on a number of things, there certainly are a number of things in this plan with which I do agree that I hope, despite the fact that I can't support it, will be voting no, that can point us in the, in the right direction. Um, the fact that we have examined for perhaps the first time, as Senator Durbin said, the tax expenditures. Um, the fact that, and I was uh, actually somewhat surprised that uh, defense um, cuts were on the table. I think there was pretty much of a consensus uh, around that. Um, and, and so I think that there is enough that all will all do agree on, despite what the vote will be, um, that makes what we have done very constructive in, in moving forward. I agree with the principles that were, were laid out, and I do agree that we are on an unsustainable fiscal path. And that can be defined, though, in a couple of ways. One, of course, is the, the deficit and the, and the debt. Um, I laid out a plan myself where we can reach uh, primary budget balance by 2015. But the other way I think that we can measure unsustainability is the growing disparity in income in the United States of America, which I think is equally a problem that we face, a problem for our democracy as well as our economy. And I don't feel that this proposal addresses these dual problems of debt and inequality in the, in the proper way. Um, when I, I agree with uh, Alice Rivlin that we need to have much more significant investment right now. When we get our economy moving, we are also decreasing the deficit. There will be more people working there will be more people buying. And I think there's somewhat of a different perception of what really does spur economic growth. To me, it is the question of demand, having money in people's pockets, jobs that they have, and unemployment insurance benefits that will make sure that they can go out and actually be customers, spend money, that that's what will drive expansion of business and small business and, and large as, as well. But the top 1% of Americans owns 34% of America's private net worth right now. Um, and the bottom 90% owns just 29%. That means that the top 1% controlled 24% of Americans in, uh, America's income in 2007. Um, it was 34% uh, now and 24% in 2007. So we are seeing a rapid expansion of growth among the wealthy, a transfer of wealth to those at the, uh, at the top. The top 10% controls more than 70% of America's total net worth in this, in this country. Only one in five working Americans enjoy guaranteed pension benefits. Those uh, young people who are worried about Social Security being there shouldn't, but they should worry that they're going to have some sort of pension. Those are rapidly disappearing, meaning there will be more focus, more need for robust Social Security, Social Security security in the, uh, in, in the future. We talk about shared sacrifice. I think these numbers indicate that sacrifice, in fact, has not been shared. That some people have lost and others have significantly gained over the last several years. So we're not starting at the same point when we say we need to share the sacrifice. Among those who are, uh, we, we have right now more than 37 million Americans, including 13 million children living in poverty, and most of those poor people have jobs. So these are working poor in the United States of America. The elderly, who I've said before, have an average 
income, including everything, private pensions and investments and savings of $18,000 a year. To say that we're going to reduce our deficit and our debt by asking Medicare beneficiaries to pay more for their health care, I think is absolutely unconscionable to have more money come out of the already 30% of their out-of-pocket income going to health care costs, I think is absolutely the wrong way to go when we do have other options. I put on the table, not as a, uh, if all else fails, but a, a public option to reduce health care costs. I said Medicare should negotiate for lower prescription drug prices, just as the Veterans Administration does, meaning that drugs are a fraction of the cost when, um, th uh, over what Medicare beneficiaries pay. There is very little control here of these expanding costs, I think as Senator Durbin pointed out, in the private sector. Social Security, let's underscore that you agree, the co-chairs agree and I agree, are not part of the deficit problem and are not being considered for paying down the long-term debt that we're looking for solvency. But the chief actuary of Social Security has pointed out that the combination of the proposals that you've made mean that someone who makes $43,000 over their lifetime, depending on when they retire, can lose more than 20% of the benefits that, that they would get under the current Social Security formulas. The changing the cost of living adjustment for the elderly, recalculating the COLA, means a significant cut in benefits because the elderly's in, uh, expenses are skewed in a different way than the rest of the population, more toward health care. So I proposed a different way of achieving 75-year solvency that doesn't hurt the elderly. When we talk about cuts in discretionary spending, although you don't totally spell them out, and also cap how much comes from revenue, which I think is an arbitrary, and I, I, I really don't understand why we do that as the debt commission, as a fiscal responsibility commission, but means, I think, inevitably, that we're gonna see programs cut that help to address the problem of those people who have not been part of the party that the wealthiest Americans have benefited from over the years. And so I, I cannot, for the, the reasons of, uh, of equity, of our democracy, of our fiscal path in terms of real live people, support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I want to thank you for presenting an alternative plan, which you do support, which does uh, address this, you know, crisis, because you realize this is a crisis we have to address. So thank you very much for your constructive Indeed. approach. Indeed. Uh, uh, Congressman Ryan. Okay, can I add before you start, for reason that Congressman Camp and Senator Baucus are not here, is they are discussing taxes as we speak. Well, first off, um, I want to thank uh, Alan and Erskine. You guys have done a tremendous job with a very difficult challenge, and uh, you got a lot thrown in your, your lap. And Bruce, you and your staff, skeleton staff, uh, we've, some of us have been in budgets for a long time. You guys have done a great job. Um, I want to just take a digression for a second. And say, I think this is the last time I'll be sitting at a table with my friend John Spratt. And um, you're a great guy, John, and uh, it's been a real privilege to serve in Congress with you. Uh, we haven't agreed on everything, but um, um, you have my respect, and I just want to say thank you for what you've done for our country. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I believe this commission has been a success. Uh, those who refuse to confront the challenges uh, facing us, they have nowhere else to hide. Uh, if they label various proposals as too draconian or austere, well, they're going to have to come up with their own right now. And so, if anything, this has been successful because it has helped us 
move this conversation to uh, more toward the adult level that it needed to go to. So regardless of what happens, regardless of whether you get these 14 votes or not, you should go home proud of what you've done to advance this debate and put ideas on the table. Um, we have a choice, which is, are we gonna confront this and leave the next generation better off or not? Uh, we're gonna have different opinions about how to do that, but you've done a lot to advance that debate. Uh, let me go, um, and I'll try to be brief, uh, let me go through what I do like about this, because I think it's important to say some positive things. Uh, I do like the fact that we're seeming to get some consensus on taxes, on not revenue levels, but on rates. Lower rates with a broader tax base leads to economic growth and job creation and international competitiveness. If anything, I think the, the, the concept that tax reform ought to be merged with budget reform is something that is incredibly important. And the best way to deal with this problem, in my opinion, is spending control and reform and economic growth. And economic growth comes from a more competitive tax system, a broader tax base and lower rates, and to that, you have done a great job in advancing this debate. I like the budget process reforms. There's some really good budget process reforms in this bill, uh, not as many as Jeb and I and others have put out there, but some great budget process reforms um, particularly uh, what we call our belts and suspenders approach to discretionary caps. I think that's pretty good. Um, Social Security. Uh, I don't like every single idea in this Social Security reform, but you have really advanced the ball and gotten us toward a better conversation on making Social Security solvent. And Jan is right. This does not contribute toward debt deficit reduction, but solvency to Social Security, which is really important. If we don't do anything, when we run out of IOUs, everybody gets a 22% across the board benefit cut. That ought to be avoided. Uh, there's discretionary savings in here, albeit it's not as many as I would like, not occurring as soon as I would like, but you're moving the ball forward on the fact that we can't keep growing discretionary spending like we have under both parties' leadership around here. Um, so what I wanted to basically say that there are some ideas in here that I think are worth copying and borrowing and putting into this next year's budget, which I fully intend to do. Um, what are my concerns? My primary concern with this plan is health care. Uh, I do not believe that this uh, sufficiently fixes the health care problem. And guess what? Our debt problem is the health care problem. Uh, GAO just gave us a new number uh, a week or two ago that says we have an $88.6 trillion unfunded liability, primarily stemming, stemming from our federal health care programs. This doesn't sufficiently address that, in my opinion. Um, I think Senator Durbin probably said it right. We are hastening the day when the only option is the public option. I think you're right. And I think this advances that possibility and likelihood. That's one of the reasons why I have a problem with it. Um, let me go to taxes, or more importantly, baselines. Um, as you know, when we look at spending cuts and revenue increases from any reform in Washington, you have to do so relative to a baseline. Now, baseline conversations can get really esoteric. They can get very confusing. But it really actually kind of matters. Um, it's important to understand what baseline is being used. And so uh, we stayed up pretty late last night going through these numbers. And it's my understanding that the baseline you're using, in rough terms, follows the president's budget, both in revenues and in spending. Um, the president's budget increases revenues by not extending all tax relief. I think that's something everybody knows about. We think that leads to a tax increase of about $983 billion. Uh, he also incre increases uh, base defense and non-defense spending and does not propose to offset the dock fix, which leads to an increase in spending. Now, to be clear, this is another way of looking at these issues, but using this baseline and excluding debt service this proposal cuts spending by about $2 for every $1 in revenue increases under a baseline that I would consider more plausible, um, a CBO-based current policy baseline. These numbers would roughly be reversed. About $2 in tax increases for $1 in spending cuts is how we look at these numbers. Um, I would like to share this with your staff, and, and maybe we can go through these before Friday. Um, but it's important to note, I think, that we've got to grow this economy and we've got to get a good down payment on taxes and spending, on spending, excuse me, now. And you really can't fix this problem. You're just delaying it if you don't really tackle health care. And I understand the position you all were put in. Uh, you're the president's appointees uh, to create this commission and he just passed through a health care law that I'm sure you weren't, weren't going to want to undo. And I understand that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that those of us who have a problem with that law um, want to sign up for something that we think 
um, advances that law. Um, and that's why uh, some of us have some concerns. But let me finish on a positive note. Um, you are to be commended. This is a serious effort. It's a serious proposal. It has advanced the debate. And I really appreciate you for the contributions that you and all my fellow colleagues have made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. You have been extremely constructive. And I've become a real uh, admirer, as I think you know. So thank you for all your help. Uh, I think if I turn back my page, it's Congressman Henserling, and then Congressman Becerra, and then Congressman Spratt, and then Ms. Budge. Well, thank you, Erskine, by placing me after Paul. I suppose you could have effectively hit the replay button. But having said that, I'm going to nonetheless take the privilege of saying much of what he said. First, I want to add my voice of praise to our two co-chairs. I think that this effort, in some respects, um, has been challenged by the design of this commission. I think juxtaposed against the recent debate over national health care, it has been challenged by timing. It has certainly not been challenged by leadership. Uh, we have had exceptional leadership uh, at this effort. Uh, both of you are to be commended. The thing I like the most about your plan is it is a plan. And frankly, there are not a lot of them out there to address the crisis. As we continue to use the word unsustainable in describing our nation's fiscal path, unsustainable is understated. And I think we all know that. Uh, when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says that our greatest threat to our national security is our debt, it should be a sobering wake-up call uh, to every American. And so, uh, again, I applaud you for simply putting a plan on the table. And frankly, I think any American who understands the crisis has a responsibility uh, to sign up for some plan, to be in favor of something. Uh, I have come to this table being one of the few and proud <laughs> to support Paul's roadmap for America's future. Uh, I have supported a spending limit amendment to the Constitution uh, and a number of proposals, some of which actually ended up in your proposal from the Spending Deficit and Debt Control Act that Paul and I have worked on. So again, I think there has been challenges to the Commission. And I think, Erskine, if I recall right, you said that this was part of an adult conversation. And I do agree, it is one of the few adult conversations about this crisis I have been able to participate in. I would like to say, and again, I didn't mean to echo Paul in all regards, I had this comment already in my notes, but the other adult conversations about this national crisis that I've participated in uh, have been led by Chairman John Spratt of South Carolina. Uh, Chairman Spratt is a man who um, uh, has rarely, rarely uh, have I acquiesced. He has not commanded my acquiescence, but he has always, always commanded my respect. Uh, he has been a very important voice in this national debate. Uh, and as he exits Congress, I hope and pray he does not exit the national debate on our nation's fiscal future. I believe that ultimately, as we look at our nation's deficit, that the deficit is the symptom, spending is the disease. As I look at the plan, and I will try to be brief, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I see as the good, what I see about as the bad. I believe an important part of this debate is the recognition that by broadening the tax base and lowering rates, we can promote economic growth, we can promote jobs. Uh, bringing down the corporate tax rate to something I believe close to the median of the EU is a very important part of this debate. I know we don't employ dynamic scoring, and I know we cannot grow our way out of this crisis. 
But I believe if we did employ dynamic scoring, this alone uh, would, would be a not insignificant part, uh, ultimately, of the solution. And I want to applaud you for that. Uh, with respect to Social Security, personally, I believe in personal carve-out accounts. Uh, I want to use the power of compound interest to grow our way out of this. Uh, that is not in this plan. Uh, but having said that, I would be more than satisfied uh, to at least save Social Security for the next couple of generations, including my eight-year-old daughter and my seven-year-old son, uh, and support the, pro pro the proposals that you have included uh, in this plan. And so I have been picketed before for my views on trying to save current entitlement programs for future generations. Um, I won't say I'm happy to do it again, but I'm prepared to certainly do it again. Um, I, I, I continue to have concern about the tax portion of this. Concern in a couple of different ways. Number one, clearly I, I, I don't favor any tax increase. I don't think we have a taxing problem. And in fact, as we both, as we all know, under CBOs, either their baseline or their alternative scenario, taxes will increase as a percentage of GDP. Uh, that, that's given. Number one, ta tax is already going up. Proposal, that's number one. Number two, ultimately, even though you put a revenue cap, we don't have a global expense cap here. And the cost of government is what it spends, not what it taxes. Uh, and I would say that is one of my greatest reservations of the plan, uh, something that I hope that we could have achieved. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, I'm not sure that uh, we're going to solve the problem that way. And the third, the, the third challenge I think you have on the tax increases is history is my guide. You know, if I believe that the increased revenue would actually be used for deficit reduction, uh, you know, I might reluctantly come to the table in a global agreement. But when I look at TEFRA in 82, when I look at Andrews Air Force Base in 90, it just seems to me that somehow the spending restraint never quite materializes, and yet the increased revenues do, and it seems like the increased revenues simply chase more spending. So personally, I believe, uh, to either quote or paraphrase Winston Churchill, who said Americans can usually be counted on to do the right thing once they've exhausted every other possibility, Again, until we have the backstop of a constitutional amendment I'm, or somehow put an enforceable spending cap on, I'm not sure the right things get done. And if taxes are going to be put on the table, I believe health care is going to have to be put on the table. There's a lot of expertise at this table. Uh, I've studied these issues as a member for eight years. I've studied it as a Senate staffer for seven years. Now, I can't come to any other conclusion that if health care is not on the table, you're not fixing the problem. And I do not believe health care is here. Now, I understand, again, the timing has been poor. There are those on the other side of the aisle who feel very passionately that what we passed in Congress is part of the solution. There are those of us who feel very, very strongly it is part of the problem. And I believe that also when you juxtapose what you're doing on the tax expenditure side, which otherwise is very good, uh, I would agree with Senator Durbin, who's no longer here. You are hastening more people into the public option, something that uh, many of us on this side of the aisle do not relish. So ultimately, I believe we must reform current entitlement programs for future generations, grandfather the grandparents. Uh, I'm willing to put defense on the table. But again, and, and I don't want to see any tax increases, but if they're on the table, health care has got to be on the table. And I just, you know, and I'll just end on this note, and I think I'm paraphrasing to some extent Senator Gregg. But we are on the verge of being the first generation in America's history to destroy the American dream. I do not believe the American dream is a shiny new Cadillac. I do not believe the American dream is home ownership. I believe the American dream is leaving your children with greater freedom, greater opportunity, and a higher standard of living than you enjoy. And every generation in our country has always kept faith with the American dream. I don't know if this is the grand bargain, but if it isn't, the grand bargain should come soon. 
And I would remind all, I don't know if this is going to get 16 votes, 14 votes, 12 votes, 10 votes, and I've lost count of how many votes you have around the table. And I don't know you're going to get my vote. I would say this. Nothing prevents our congressional leaders in this Congress or the next from bringing this plan to the floor. There's nothing magical about the 14 votes. Fine, you get a nice little seal on the cover, I suppose. But nothing prevents them from bringing this plan to the floor. Nothing prevents them from bringing um, uh, Rivlin Domenici to the floor, the roadmap to the floor. Uh, I, I, personally, I would like to see this plan come to the floor. It may come to the floor without my vote. Uh, but we must advance the debate, uh, and I hope that we seize the moment, and I thank you. Thank you very much, Jeb. Very thoughtful. Jeb. You, you've been extraordinarily helpful, and you've been positive, and you've been supportive, uh, and I deeply appreciate it. Uh, we'll go to Congressman Becerra, and then Congressman Spratt, and Ms. Fudge, and Mr. Stern. Uh, let me, uh, to begin by saying, for, first to, to Alan and to Erskine, thank you for doing what many people bet you could not do, and that is to keep 18 commissioners with very diverse views together to this point so that we would be discussing a plan which, although the two of you put it together, uh, certainly a number of the members at this table may find themselves prepared to vote for. And so I think that uh, may be the story uh, of this commission's life, that uh, somehow the two of you found a way to keep all of us working together, and I, I applaud you for that. Let me also thank each and every one of our commission colleagues who participated. It could have, this could have easily uh, collapsed uh, immediately, before we got to this point, certainly, uh, had we all decided to run to the media and start talking about what we liked and didn't like or, or to undercut your efforts as chair. So I, I think uh, to each of my colleagues on this commission, I say thank you for helping make this a constructive effort. Um, perhaps the second bit of news that I, if I were writing uh, the front page of my newspaper uh, after the headline where Erskine and Allen kept us all together working and actually saw saw us to the point of having a plan presented is that um, you were serious. You put taboos on the table. Sacred cows are in your plan. Uh, and I think, if nothing else, we have laid before the American public a template that gives people an opportunity to start discussing what we have to do to try to get our fiscal house in order. Uh, I, I started the first time we met by saying that, to me, we have to somehow rec uh, get to the point of understanding how it is that we went from surpluses as far as the eye could see 10 years ago to deficits as far as the eye could see today. Something happened, dramatically happened, in these 10 years that caused us to go from an economy that was just churning to an economy that's in the hospital. Some of it we know is cyclical. It's a, a part of the structural uh, process we go through in our economy. And so you have to uh, acknowledge that a good portion of this is due to the fact that we have ups and downs. And right now we're in a, in a down that's uh, become very deep. But part of it's because, as I think you say in the beginning of your report, and if I can just quote it, since the last time our budget was balanced in 2001, and I'm reading from page 10, the looming fiscal crisis, the second paragraph. Since the last time our budget was balanced in 2001, the federal debt has increased dramatically, rising from 33% of GDP to 62% of GDP in 2010. The escalation was driven in large part by two wars, which by the way, I, I always emphasize, were never paid for. And so we borrowed money to pay for those two wars and continue to borrow to pay for those two wars. But the sentence again reads, the escalation was driven in large part by two wars and a slew of fiscal, fiscally irresponsible policies along with a deep economic downturn. To me, the, the resolution of our fiscal crisis into the future depends on making sure that we no longer get involved in activities that we're not willing to pay for and that we're not irresponsible. 
because we were humming along, creating surpluses, creating millions of jobs for Americans, and now we're not. And so to me, I want to attack those problems. What, caused, what were the sacred cows that had us partying for some while others were left to clean up the mess? I believe this plan identified some of those sacred cows, and I believe that for those reasons, it's worth considering where this plan takes us. And so let me just briefly then tell you what I think are the absolute positives of this plan. As I said, you put those taboos on the table. You create firewalls. Firewalls are critical because we know what happens in this place. Everyone poaches, and the, the, the best poachers are the most influential. The special interests that have tons of money know how to poach best, and they know how to succeed. So when it comes to making cuts, we may all have benevolent motives, but at the end of the day, it's the, the strongest of the poachers who prevails. And so invariably, what gets cut is not necessarily the most important place to start creating responsibility. Secondly, you did something that I think few people were willing to do, and you identified these tax earmarks. Uh, if we want to talk about spending, you can't just talk about it on the appropriation side, because quite honestly, our spending on the tax side dwarfs anything we do on the appropriation side. Indeed, we had this conversation, we've heard this conversation about spending earmarks, appropriations earmarks, $16 billion in, in a year. A tax, tax earmark spending in our budget is 70 times greater than appropriations earmarks. It would take us 70 years of having eliminated appropriations earmarks to equal one year of <coughs> spending through the tax code on just the earmarks. And so I applaud you for having raised that. But let me tell you where I do have some concerns with the plan, and I, I have to think these through. While you took on the earmarks, I think you did it very anemically. If over the last 10 years, we've averaged some $11 trillion in tax giveaways, tax earmarks, and if your plan over the next 10 years takes care of a $4 trillion problem, we had almost three times the amount of money that you have in your plan in cuts available through tax earmarks over the last 10 years. To me, you punted. We punted. If you really want to take on the special interests, the poachers, you would have taken on the biggest poachers. Uh, there are no school kids that I know of who forced us to spend money on textbooks. We do it because it's, it's an investment. But there are a whole bunch of folks who have tax breaks in the tax code because they spent tons of money to make sure they got to poach. The fact that this plan only dedicates about 10% of those earmarks that you've identified in the tax code to help resolve the deficit is to me say that for the last 10 years where some $11 trillion went out through tax earmarks that we're only going to ask for a small percentage of that to help now deal with the deficits that we face. That to me is, is anemic and as I said, I think we, this commission would punt if it would allow that to occur. Secondly, I think on the issue of the appropriation spending, as I said, the firewalls are so important, but if they're not real, we're going to end up making cuts that are devastating to middle class America. And once again, the folks who party for a decade will not have to clean up their mess. And so I, I believe it's time the Department of Defense was on the table. Maybe perhaps for the first time we're going to ask the Department of Defense to be audited and be able to account for itself as a result of an audit so we can figure out where the waste and the fraud is. But we have to be serious about that. And finally, I, I will say that given the serious way that the chair uh, address this problem that I want to make sure I give a serious response to your efforts on Social Security. Uh, I have a father who worked all his life with his hands. He got about a sixth grade education, so he did everything from canning tomatoes to fixing the brakes on railroad cars to cleaning the hulls of ships in the LA ports to uh, picking every crop you can think of up and down the states of California, Oregon, and Washington, and then spending the bulk of his, his time doing road construction during the heyday of uh, our freeway construction. Uh, when he retired, and he retired in his 50s because we forced him to, uh, he already showed the effects of all that physical labor. Uh, as, as Ms. Schakowsky said, if we're gonna make this a plan that works for America, it's because it invests in Americans. 
those who work very hard. Social Security to me is not a problem in terms of the fiscal crisis we face. Today, Social Security has trillions of dollars in surplus, trillions. There is no aspect of the federal government, the operating side of the federal budget, that has anything near a dollar in surplus. And so to say we must take on Social Security, I think is a, uh, should be a dead herring. Uh, it, it doesn't really work here. Absolutely, we have to deal with the long-term solvency. But I guarantee you, if we could talk about the federal government's operating budget being something we have to resolve because in 30 years, the federal government is going to have a deficit, we wouldn't be sitting here. Social Security is in surplus, and it won't have a problem for at least 25 to 30 years. We have to resolve it so it doesn't become a big problem in 25 or 30 years. But to say you have to do it now is, I think, is to uh, mark a disservice to someone like my father who worked very hard and paid in all this, lot, all this time to Social Security. So I will look very closely at anything that's done on Social Security, but I'm not interested in cutting the benefits of, of a man who never made more than about $22,000 in a year working with his hands simply because we have to take care of the fiscal mess that was caused by a lot of poachers in this economy. And so uh, I don't know if anyone could have done a better job than Erskine and Allen in keeping us at this table. As you can see, I have some concerns. But I don't want to leave the table because I started off that very first day saying everything must be on the table. And I know one thing, Allen and Erskine, you left everything on the table. And for that, I'm going to stay at the table uh, we'll see what happens on Friday, but I intend to stay at the table because you did me the, the, the valuable service of letting my father know that you left everything on the table. Thank you, Javier. Thank you and I worked on immigration stuff together, and you always kept your word with me. And you've been great, and uh, I hope you end up being a great leader of our party. So thank you, sir. Uh, I now go to my congressman. And my friend, my lifelong friend, uh, the person who I can tell you, uh, while lots of us in the Clinton administration got credit for the balanced budget in 1997, it would not have happened uh, without the leadership of Chairman Spratt. So, Chairman Spratt, thank you for all you've done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't believe that. Is it working? Okay. First of all, to our co-chairs, I'd like to echo what everyone else has said. We wouldn't be here where we are about to do something of high significance, but for their tremendous efforts. Secondly, to the staff and their output, made a huge contribution to this. And to my two friends, Paul Ryan and Jeb Hensling, I'll miss doing battle with you over the budget this year. <laughs> I wish you'd said those things before to know them <laughs> We showed that you can have comedy, and you can have civility, and you can have constructive debate <clears throat> without necessarily being coming to a conclusion on all the same points. We, we've proved it can be done. Nevertheless, we never did sit down and make a search for common ground and come up with a budget that was truly a deficit reduction budget. This is an opportunity that may not pass again soon. Indeed, if it fails here today, I'm not sure what its destiny is likely to be. I would like to make one thing clear. Most of my points have already been made several times, but I think it bears repeating that the illustrative, that the cuts that are outlined in this proposal, mainly in the expenditure, uh, in the area of uh, tax expenditures, are illustrative. They, this, this committee, commission, call it what you will, has no authority to pass any particular law, even to put it in process of being passed. But it does lay down an agreement. It does lay down a proposal. And to those who would say, well, that's great, but how would you do it? They come forward with policy-based arguments, changes in law that would uh, accomplish the bottom line results that, uh, that they claim. I've been concerned about certain aspects of the budget, but if it succeed, and Erskine knows this from 1997, we worked together hand in glove on that particular agreement, it has to be perceived in the Congress and in the country as balanced, fair, and equitable. I had a problem with discretionary spending to start with. I think it's right to put multi-year caps. I think it's right to have firewalls. But if you ask anyone who knows the subject well, he or she would likely say to you, the real source of this problem is twofold. One is the revenues tax cuts, and the other is mandatory spending. And yet the 
reduction in discretionary spending, as I understand it, I'm not quite sure where it stands right now with the latest draft, but in previous drafts, the reduction in dis discretionary spending was two times the reduction in mandatory spending, even though mandatory is part of the problem. And revenues, I remarked before that it's a little odd that we're on the threshold of passing a renewal of the 0103 tax cuts, which has an impact, revenue impact, I believe, of about $4 trillion. And this package over which we're laboring to give birth to has about the same impact. If we did nothing on the tax cuts, you'd have about the same bottom line effect as we've gotten, as we've achieved through all of the uh, proposals that are made in this particular agreement. That has to strike you as ironic. But I go back to my initial point, which is to emphasize that this agreement doesn't go from here to the House of the Floor, Floor House, Floor of the House, or the Floor of the Senate. It goes to the committees of jurisdiction. And they will decide what policies are implemented in order to achieve the bottom line results that are essential to achieving the overall results of this package. We only make here illustrative ideas that are feasible, that can be done, and that have policy-based reasons for being changed. And given that, what we're looking at here is an, a great opportunity I won't declare my colors until I've read it all. But this is an opportunity. This is a process. If it fails, I don't think we'll revisit for some time to come. I think it's extremely important that we be continue the process. I think they've given us a baseline upon which to build and build constructively. I think we should keep this process moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Spratt. Uh, you're the greatest. Uh, we're going to Ms. Fudge, Mr. Stern, Dr. Coburn, and then Senator Crapo. Well, first of all, let me add my thanks to Erskine and Allen and the staff for incredible leadership. And being the first time to serve on a commission and as probably the only one on the commission with no political affiliation, it's been quite an interesting experience. I um, came to this with no ideology, no ideological perspective on how to address the issue other than as a citizen with children and grandchildren concerned about the future. And it was clear to me that all of you had the same feelings as well. There are a couple of things that I would just um, like to highlight. As we've developed this framework, and I do believe it's a framework, whether we get 14 votes or not, I believe, discussing with my colleagues, that many of the things that have been listed here will indeed be addressed, if not all of them. But it's important as we chart a future of growth for our country that we put into perspective the importance of how much we look in the rearview mirror historically and how much we look to the future. And I think that's what we've tried to do with this document, is to understand clearly the demographic trends, to understand clearly the need for greater global competitiveness, because we are indeed slipping, to understand the need for continued focus on education and the need to develop a talent base here in this country that can compete globally, and more importantly, to get back to a position of economic growth. And we can all differ on whether we think this is the right approach to get there, but let me say this. I deeply support what we're trying to do in terms of tax reform. From a business standpoint, we have been hamstrung by the tax laws that we currently have in place relative to our global competitors. I also think it is time to look at Social Security, not just for the next 20 or 30 years, but for where we're going to be longer term. And if we don't take the action now, then we don't put ourselves in a position to address the issue longer term. Which brings me to the final point. I do believe the time is now. I would hope that as we move forward that we don't find ourselves caught up in a process which takes us years to implement 
many of these things that if we take action now, and that's been reinforced by many of the people who came before the commission during the course of our deliberations, the importance of taking action now can put us on a path for more strong future over the long term than if we wait and discuss and the years go by and we find ourselves in a place we don't want to be. And I think several of my colleagues have reinforced the point, which I strongly believe, and we've seen it play out, that once the ball starts rolling in the wrong direction, it moves with rapid speed in a way that we can't then impact it. We have the opportunity now to impact our future. And if we wait to act on certain things, we risk putting that ability to shape our future in great jeopardy. So I, for one, support this. Do I agree with everything in it? No. But have I had a chance to read it and review it and say, you know, I'm about 80% there. And that, to me, is more than enough to agree that this is the framework for us to move forward. And I thank you for your work. And I would particularly like to thank Senators Conrad and Greg, because I think it really has been your impetus and focus to making this commission and helping us come together that has brought us to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma I, I, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, Mr. Stern. So I, I, said at the, I said at the first meeting that uh, I, I do love this country, and I happen to think, like the two congressmen here said, that, that it really is a gift. And it's been a gift for me and my grandfather, Lewis the Butcher, was still alive to imagine me sitting at a table with all of these congressmen and senators. It's, it's been an enormous honor and opportunity. And I just want to say to people uh, everywhere, including my own community, if this process did anything for me, it made me appreciate what a dangerous and precarious situation we face as a nation and our inability to act and our waiting to act will only make the situation uh, a lot worse. Two is I just want to say I, I don't normally get a chance to sit at the table with so many Republicans, and I, uh, <laughs> I acknowledge that Jeb and Paul are appropriately on my right. Um, <laughs> but to, to them and to Dave and to Ann, I mean, I think this was an, a unique process where I really got to understand and learn that, that people really are serious about getting something done and a lot of the caricatures and stereotypes, and I appreciate the environment you set, Alan and Erskine, that I think made this a somewhat different process than most people have a chance to experience uh, in Washington, D.C. I think Paul Ryan said it right. No matter what happens, the commission's been a success. We've focused the views of the nation um, on a very serious problem, a very sobering problem. It actually got me, as, uh, as Alan Simpson said, to actually have to write my own plan, because I agree strongly with Jeb that in the end this is about plans. It's not about ideas. It's not about what your favorite things are. And I tried to write, and I'll soon let it out, but a plan that really fits within the framework of uh, the co-chairs in terms of the $4 trillion cuts, the same kind of discretionary spending, many of the same tax things. But I just want to end, and people can read it, and it'll sort of give you a sense of you know, a lot of agreement I have and a couple of things that obviously I think are differently. I just want to end by saying this. I think the problem in Washington too often is that we're historians and not futurists. And unfortunately, as I said in the first meeting, we are at a very different moment of economic history. This is the third economic revolution, uh, and where the industrial took 300 years and the agricultural took 3,000, it's only taking 30 years, and we are now witnessing what a global economy is and having to act in ways that we're not familiar with in our country to make strong, swift, decisive, and fast uh, decisions. And I just want to just put on the table some things that I don't think are necessarily part all are part of this report, but what I think really goes to the whole question of jobs, economic growth, and competitiveness in the long run. One is the tax system, and I think you hit the sweet spot or the right spot, you know, about tax expenditures and about lowering rates and about sort of cleaning this mess up so that American people don't have to hire tax accountants and Dave doesn't have to sit with uh, all kinds of experts every time he makes a business decision to try to figure out how to arbitrage the taxes. That's not how we should do business in America, what our CEOs uh, should be needing to spend time on. Two, when it comes to health care, I, I appreciate we want to go back and look at oh, the Obama and the Congress's decision on health care. I think we have to go forward, because I think we now know a series of things. One, 
which I always like to say we're the only nation on earth, if we want to be competitive, that still puts the price of our health care on the cost of our products and competes against nations around the world that don't. That is a stupid economic and competitive plan. Two, the problem we have in health care is not going to be fixed, I believe, by patching up a system we have. It needs fundamental restructuring. I know Paul Ryan has one set of ideas. I think in Germany and Switzerland and other countries around the world, there are other sets of ideas. But we are at a moment of restructuring, not just trying to patch up a, a, a plan that now costs us 5% more of GDP than any other country on Earth. We cannot afford 5% more of GDP and compete in a global economy. And how we deal with that, that will be a great debate. But we need to deal with it, and we need to deal with it soon. Fourth, I want to say that for all the discussion about competitiveness and about lowering corporate tax rates, I do want to acknowledge that most countries around the world also have an additional way to help their competitiveness, and, and that is to have some kind of consumption tax. And it, if you look throughout Europe and other places, they lower tax rates, and so could we if we did it. Michael Gratz talks about eliminating 100 million tax returns. Um, but we need to think about uh, t taxes that help our exports and, and defer or hurt our imports. And right now we have a tax system that doesn't really help us, but a system around the world that helps everyone else. And finally, I'd say that we don't have any pool of investment. And I really appreciate what the co-chairs have done and they're sort of they're cut and invest, as they know that's not my methodology of doing it. But I think in the end, the PAYGO system never allows us to amass enough capital for the big investments this country needs to do because you have to gore someone else to get your money. And if we can't figure out a way to find the capital to invest in broadband and infrastructure and water that we never get to or we have to push it into a stimulus bill or some other way, that is not a reasoned way for a country to make decisions about its long-term investment. So I admire what you've done. I've written my own attempt to try to get to the same place. Um, but I do think we need to tackle some of the biggest issues facing ourselves. And my last challenge is this. There is no reason, I think, as, as Congressman Henselin said, that the President of the United States, that the leaders of the House and the Senate cannot put a plan on the floor of, of their bodies this year. And we should keep voting and debating and amending until we have a plan, because it can't wait any longer. Thank you. Uh, I think if there were two people who I came up here with a caricature of, it was Andy Stern and Dr. Coburn. And I couldn't have been wronger on both. Uh, you couldn't have been more constructive, and I thank you for that. And Dr. Coburn has not only become my doctor, <laughs> but he has become my friend. And uh, nobody's staff has been more helpful to us than Dr. Coburn's staff. And uh, he has pursued this with logic each and every step. So thank you for all you've done. We'll go to you, Dr. Coburn. Well, <clears throat> Alan and Erskine, I'd like to thank you for your efforts. I'd also like to recognize Joelle Cannon on my staff, who spent a lot of sleepless nights working with your staff, who spent a lot of sleepless nights trying to, to develop a product. Um, you know, a, as a physician, uh, I'm trained to find the real problem. What's the real problem? Not the symptoms, but what are the, what are the symptoms and signs lead me to is what is the real disease? And uh, the real disease is we've abandoned the concepts of our founders. We've created reliance instead of depending on self-reliance. We've created government programs that are unaffordable. Uh, we've uh, abandoned limited government. We've abandoned the enumerated powers. And now we're in trouble. And nobody's looking at what the real problem is. Uh, and the real problem is us. Uh, Alexander Tyler said all, democracy, all republics fail. The average age of the world's republics is 200 years. And they all fail because eventually the populace learns that they can vote them something from the public treasury. And they all fail over fiscal issues. They're not conquered from without before they rot from within. And we're rotting. We're rotting as we sit here and speak today. Uh, in 2004, I had the privilege of reading a book by Peter Peterson. I want to give him credit. Uh, he talked about where we are today long before anybody was talking about it. He wrote the book in 2002. It's called Running on Empty. And it wasn't a partisan book, but it raised the level 
of awareness of several of us to what was happening. And if you don't think we're in trouble, think about the following numbers. Next year, $36 trillion has to be funded in the world. There's $23 trillion available to fund it. That's what the borrowing is going to be for governments all across this world. What do you think is going to happen to interest rates? What's going to happen to the cost of not living within your economic means? It's going to be disastrous for us. And the threat isn't coming in four or five years. It's coming in one or two. We have a Fed that's monetizing our debt, and all our trading partners are reacting to it negatively uh, in the hopes that we can stimulate our economy when the real problem is, is we have way too much government and not enough of the thing that made America great, which is independence, personal responsibility, and self-reliance. And we've created dependency. And one, one great example is one in 19 Americans today get SSDI or SSI. It's one in 19 Americans are disabled, and when the law says you're only disabled if there's no job in the economy you can perform, and we don't address that issue in this plan, it's good. the SSDI is going to be broken eight, eight years, seven years. And we're adding more, and they're getting ready to add two new, two new categories to disability in the next month without congressional oversight or anything else. We are out of control as a government. We have abandoned the principles that made America exceptional, which wasn't the government. It was the people. Last name is pronounced Coach. It was us relying on ourselves, not saying, I can take a pass and depend on the government. And that does not, says nothing about not wanting to make sure things are there for those who truly need our help. A compassionate response to those that cannot fix their situation any other way. We ought to be there to help them. But that's not what we've created in our country. And there are a lot of things that I think have been accomplished through this commission. There's a lot of knowledge been gained by a lot of people. We've totally disregarded the long-term problems that we have with health care. I agree with Paul and Jeff. Paul's roadmap is a way to solve that problem. Nobody, nobody has come forward with another solution because nobody has the courage to come forward and say we can't have what we think we have today and still have a future. And Paul has had the courage and those that have supported what he's done to come say if in fact we want to solve the problems, everybody has to sacrifice, which means you cannot be comfortable with the status quo. Um, the real problems for our nation are going to come forward in two years. We have a Treasury Department that's still borrowing short-term money with a false idea that they're going to save interest costs rather than buying us some time by extending our debt uh, terms because they're sacrificing the good for the short term, what looks good in the short term for the very real problems for the long term. So we have the administration doing the same thing the politicians do. Don't do the tough, right, hard thing. Do what looks good. Uh, this plan is a plan. Uh, the people have worked on it, have struggled to try to build a consensus. Uh, I have heartaches with tons of it. Uh, but I know we have to go forward. This isn't the first. I, if we pass this plan by the Congress two years from now, we're going to be coming back and making it more difficult. This is just the down payment on what are some very real, difficult sacrifices that everybody in this country is going to have to make. And if you really think about what built our country and what's the heritage of our country, it is sacrifice. What Jeb talked about, creating the, the real freedom, the real opportunity as it goes forward. It's not about owning a house. It's about having the potential to own a house. And so, so my questions really come down is, will we come together and put something out, even though probably 50% of it I'm not happy with, 
as a down payment to make a statement that says this problem is so real, Tom Coburn can't have what he wants. And I can't. And I'm going to have to sacrifice. And my family's going to sacrifice. But I want to make sure my grandchildren have some of the same opportunities and freedom that I've experienced. <clears throat> the potential for us to re-embrace the real character and success of America only will come if we embrace the principles that our founders embraced when they started this. When Benjamin Franklin was asked, you've all heard this, what did you do? He said, I gave you a republic if you can keep it. Well, I think we ought to be cheating history. History says we're not going to make it. And the way we cheat history is for all of us to give up something. Everybody at this table, give up something. And then say, the way forward for America is everybody to start sacrificing so we create a future that is honoring the tremendous sacrifice that came before us. And I share the view uh, you've given me. I didn't know who you were. Uh, all I know is that you were a man of integrity and honesty and directness, and you're real. All I can say is I, I hope everybody sees that because I couldn't have more respect than I do for you. Thank you for the guidance and the wisdom you've given me. Uh, Senator Crapo. Thank you very much. And uh, am I the wrap-up speaker? <laughs> You're the wrap-up. Lean up. <laughs> Don't you wish? Uh, I'm not going to tell you whether that is the case today. Uh, I, as many others have said, I'm going to continue to study this for a day or so to be sure. Uh, but the fact that I, I'm not going to give my decision today and the fact that I'm the wrap-up speaker doesn't mean that I'm not going to tell you what I think of what I see here and of the process. Uh, and I first want to go back to uh, comments that have been made by many uh, with regard to Erskine and Allen. Uh, I didn't know either of you uh, well. I had probably met you in uh, social occasions, but uh, really during this commission deliberation uh, is where I came to know both of you. And I have uh, developed a great respect and friendship and admiration for you. And frankly, for all of the other members of the commission, a, a number of the others of you I did not know well. Others I did know very well uh, because of the, the machinations of Congress and how we work together here. But uh, I just have to make the first comment that I think I've heard from all of you, that the relationships that we've developed on this commission have been a very big part of the success of it. And, uh, and I personally have great respect and admiration for each of the commission members. I also want to add to that the other Idahoan on the commission uh, our executive director, Bruce Reed, and, and uh, he has been outstanding in his efforts to help bring us together and, and to deliver work product for us as we've made demands. Now, having said that, uh, I do share a lot of the uh, opinions that have been expressed at the table by other members of the commission, and uh, I won't go over all of those, but I want to just kind of, as many have done, talk about the positives and some of the concerns that I have. As w with everybody here, I got a lot of heartburn about this. Uh, there are also some things in here that are really, really important to me and that I think to the American people. And let me just go through those a little bit. At the outset of this process, I was very concerned that this commission would uh, take too small or too limited a view of our task. There has been plenty of discussion here at the table that I won't go over about the threat that we face and about how we are on an, on an unsustainable course. And I, I will repeat the, what someone else said, that, that uh, we are understating it. If, if we do not clearly uh, spell out in our minds and in the, in, for the American people what the alternative of inaction is. And in fact, for those who uh, Alan mentioned who will be attacking whatever happens here at, at, from this commission, or any other plans that are brought forward, 
I think it's important that America understands those attacks and understands the discourse and the debate that will take place on this issue in the context of what the status quo is and whether the status quo is better or worse than what is being proposed in this or other plans and proposals. And, uh, and frankly, uh, when a clear understanding of what we are facing is, under, is achieved, I, I think a better perspective on this proposal is achieved. That being said, I was concerned as this process started out, very concerned that we would have too limited a view and that we would not really take the opportunity to, to make the bold steps that need to be made and come forward with a bold comprehensive plan that will help get us on the pathway to achieving the American dream as has been described here and to making it so that this generation can pass on to the next generation the opportunity for a greater standard of living and for greater freedoms and for the ability to live their lives in, in this country with the freedom that they deserve. In terms of the strengths of this proposal that I see, one of the key strengths is that it does recognize that spending is the problem. It also, I think very fortunately, recognizes that on the revenue side, the issue is reform of our tax code. That is one of the most significant big parts of this plan as I see it. I've said to many of you in other meetings that if, if we as a country set out to, to create a tax code that was more inefficient, more unfair, more costly to comply with, or more anti-competitive in terms of making us less competitive with the rest of the economies of the world, we probably couldn't do much worse a job than what we've got with our current tax code. And yet in Congress, we continue to have the debates which we are having right now in other rooms in the Capitol building about whether to raise or lower the rates. And what we ought to be talking about is what kind of a tax code should we have? And this proposal puts that on the table and moves the debate into the arena of how should we structure our tax code, which is a key part of how do we make our economy dynamic and strong and build back the strength that we need to build if we are going to deliver that American dream option in a strengthened position to the next generation. I think that that's very, very important. Uh, Erskine, I think you said that you didn't think we should hollow out our country while we were fixing our fiscal problems. And, uh, and I agree with that. And on, on the revenue side of the picture, I think that is one of the, the key things that we must focus on. Uh, we must reform the tax code. In addition, as I've thought about the areas where I have problems, and, and as you might guess, they are similar to the issues that Jeb and Paul and, and uh, Tom have raised. It struck me as I was thinking about it that in most of those areas, my concerns are with what is not in the plan as opposed to what is in the plan. Not all of them, but some of them, and in fact, most of them. I agree, I, agree. I think it was David that said that, that uh, he thought the plan ought to go further. And frankly, on the, uh, on the spending side, I think it should. It doesn't go far enough to get us where we need to get. Uh, and, and we need to have a more robust effort to address the spending issues. But the plan does take very strong steps on the spending side. Uh, as you know, Erskine, I have continuously harped about the fact that process is critical. You can control the outcome with process, or you can assure that you can't achieve the outcome if you don't have adequate process protections in place. And although uh, there are some good process protections in here, I would like to see them strengthened so that we can have even a stronger guarantee that the, that the path that this plan sets out is one that, that is followed. Uh, I appreciate, though, the fact that uh, added to the reform just recently has been one of the requests that I made that if we do, in fact, see a dynamic impact on our economy as a result of the tax reform and the spending reform and the other efforts of this panel, then those increases in revenue, 
as they are plugged into the fiscal picture of our Congress and our country are to be used for deficit reduction or rate relief in our tax policy as opposed to more <laughs> spending. And, to, and, and I appreciate that reform being put into this package. Uh, that's one of those kinds of things that, just an example of one of the things that was put in that I thought wasn't in there when the first proposal was put out. I agree with the concerns about the, the uh, limited nature of reform in the health care arena, which is probably the biggest arena on the spending side that we need to be reforming. And so uh, I have concerns that we have not achieved what we need to achieve there, and we need to move forward. And where does all this, this bring me? Uh, there, there are others. Uh, I, I want to mention one other before I go on, and that is, uh, as I believe Jeb mentioned, I've uh, from day one believed that we should have some kind of an enforceable global spending cap. Uh, we've got a global revenue cap, and although it's a little higher than I think it should be, it's at least a cap. Right now the cap is 99 or 100 percent, and uh, this is at least moving it dramatically in the right direction. And, and if you put in there the protections that if a dynamic economy does build out of what we were trying to do here, that the revenue is pushed into deficit reduction or rate relief, then that improves the, the circumstance there. But we need a global spending cap. So as I evaluate this plan, like I said, I'm not sure where I come down now because there is a lot of heartburn in here with me and there's a lot of very positive steps here that I think this country needs to be engaging in quickly. But as, as I look at it, I don't see anything that stops Congress from engaging in more health care reform. I don't see anything in the plan that says that we can't add some stronger process protections. And I don't see anything in the plan that says that we can't engage in further, further reform of the spending and further control and further reduction of the spending excesses in Congress. <coughs> and so the question that I have is, uh, are we putting into place a system that will at least get us heavily down the road in the right direction and allow the process in Congress to fill it out and strengthen it as we move forward? Or are we putting into place a system that really doesn't get there and uh, sees the tax increases occur, but the spending reductions not occur, or the kinds of problems that have been referenced with earlier reforms. And those are the kinds of serious questions that I have. Uh, frankly, if we can get rate reduction out of dynamic growth in the economy, we may be able to dramatically change the ratio. In fact, I think we will dramatically change the ratio of of uh, how much of the solution is coming from where it should be, which is the spending, versus uh, revenue increases. And so I know that uh, I've just uh, sort of gone across the waterfront here on a, some of the issues, but I believe that this kind of, if these kinds of issues and this kind of thought process is what we ought to all go through as we evaluate whether we should vote to send this plan forward to Congress. Remember, I mean, this plan right now is a concept plan. It's got some good detail, but Congress is going to have to put a lot of structure to this as the, the proposals are turned from this stage into legislative language. And, uh, and my hope is that some of my heartburn can be addressed in that process. And, and, and um, uh, it's, it's a question. You know, I, I, really, I really do struggle with whether we are going to give uh, life to a process that can uh, put us on the right path, moving in the right direction, and give us the opportunity to strengthen it, or whether it's a process that will end up putting into place the mechanisms for uh, the kind of failures that I think some of the other efforts have uh, faced in the past. And that'll be my decision, and how, that'll be the basis on which I make my decision as I uh, further review all of the provisions that you've got in here. But again, I want to thank you for the effort. It has been an outstanding uh, work product to this point, and, and nobody could have done it better. Thank, thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I, Senator Conrad and I were down here shaking our heads uh, at everything you said, and we were nodding in agreement. We hope this is a, a start. Uh, 
it's not a final step by any stretch of the imagination. We got some heavy lifting ahead of us, uh, especially you all who are elected representatives. And I hope for one that you're a leader in that process. Uh, shoot, I'm, I've only been down the Snake River, so I don't know a lot about Idaho, but I know a leader when I see one, and you are one. Thank you all so much for being a part of this. Uh, Al's got a few words he wants to say, oh. but I just, I just want to make sure that you know uh, that uh, uh, we're going to try to get together Friday. If that's uh, not possible with people, then we'll look for you all to let us know by 11 o'clock on Friday where you stand on this, uh, Senator Gregg. Well, I just want to note that I have a long standing family commitment. He does. Senator Gregg has a long standing well, family be here, which I apologize commitment for. where he can't, but he's already. I wouldn't miss your wife's 60th birthday. Go ahead. It's all right. <laughs> no, you don't do that. <laughs> but we wouldn't be. <laughs> we, we, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be here without you and Senator Conrad, and so I thank you very much for your strong support and leadership. Well, uh, I also want to thank uh, Bruce Reed, as you all have done, and our team. Last night I got an email from Bruce at 3.38, <laughs> night before last at 2.58, and the night before that at 2.38. Uh, Bruce Reed has been a great leader, and anything smart I've said came out of his brain. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't believe all of that. Let me tell you, uh, uh, the roses are being thrown around, and it's nice. I, I we don't want to whiff them until we see what happens, and it won't matter. Uh, but you two, thank you, both of you. You just stuck, and, and it was tough for you to face that defeat in the Senate, and you rose above that and got in here and gnashing your teeth like, I don't know if you guys can do it. We tried in the Senate. It didn't work. But you stuck, and, and, it, and it worked. And Bruce, uh, you're just a husk of your former self. <laughs> you have walking pneumonia, but you can go sleep somewhere. But let me say to Mike, I can assure you that this is a big, undigestible lump, and there's nothing in here that should cause you concern about being watered down. This baby is stuck in the craw of America and it won't go away. It's indigestible, absolutely indigestible. So you should feel confident. It was crafted that way because I got as much pain as Tom. I come from a state filled with oil and gas and coal. I may have to divert my flight. <laughs> I may have to creep through Montana, <laughs> through Bacchus country, to get home when I get home to see you, son, you, you messed with the depletion allowance, you messed with tight gas, you messed with gas, you messed with fossil, you messed with energy subsidies. What were you, hell were you doing? I'll say, lowering your tax rate, Jack, what's your next problem? That you stuff it right back in them, which I've always enjoyed. <laughs> I'll bet we will adjourn. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>